My name's Ross Smith. I'm the Professor of English at ANU. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking today from the lands of the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I also want to start with just a couple of remarks about the Centre for Australian Literary Cultures, if you're joining us for the first time. We had a fantastic series, uh, seminar series last year, incredibly well intended and just some, some magical, magical papers. I'm hoping for the same thing this year. Um, the Centre is kind of a really important new initiative for us in English. Um, and it's because, you know, at the moment, as you all know, it's a, it is a little bit of time of diminishing support for an investment in Australian literature across the university sector. And we're trying to do something to redress that, I guess, um, through CALC. And CALC is committed to raising the visibility of Australian literary cultures broadly defined, both at ANU and beyond. Um, CALC is about taking an interdisciplinary approach, a broad approach to Australian literary cultures. And we aim to continue ANU's founding position in understanding and promoting Australian literature, but also to try to reimagine this national legacy that we're working with to connect us all newly to the conversations, ideas and approaches to literary cultures that are taking place locally, nationally and internationally. And we have some exciting news today, which is that um, we've been made an official university research centre. Um, so that, yeah, that's a big thing at ANU. There's, you know, there's not many of them. Uh, there's only four in our college, I mean, it's a bigger college across arts and social sciences. So now there's five and we're one of them. So it's really great news for us. And we're super excited to now sort of embark on all the events and programs that we've had in the pipeline, including this seminar series um, for which Tina's paper is um, kicking it off. Um, so that's sort of all for me, just what Calc is and that we've got, we're sort of growing and we've got this great new status. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to Elizabeth McMahon, who's gonna be the chair of today's seminar. Liz is an Associate Professor at the School of Arts and Media at UNSW, and all of us in Australian literature know of her work on island studies, on gender studies, and on Australian literature more broadly. So thanks, Liz. Thanks, Roz. I'm delighted to be here. Sorry to be here because in the, in the, for the reason that Mon is not, you know, terrifically well, but delighted to be here and very, very happy to hear about the Calc News. Um, it's, really, it's really wonderful. Um, and I'm especially excited to introduce um, this person in this paper, which just looks fantastic. Um, Christina Lupton is professor at the University of Warwick and the University of Copenhagen. She is author of three monographs, Knowing Books, um, which was uh, I was having a look at, uh, and this uh, uh, examination of the self-conscious textuality and relationship between author, narrator and audience, um, and the knowledge of that that belongs to no one, as, as uh, Tina says. Um, and then the next is reading and the making of time in the 18th century. And uh, in this, the perennial question about how do people find time to read and how does reading construct our concept of time? And uh, she argues that books have always posed a problem of time for readers, one that academics always cite about what kind of reading they do, a really interesting kind of dilemma. Um, then uh, recently, we have Love and the Novel, Life After Reading, which was just, is described as a delicious combination of critical thought and passionate personal experience. And we're getting really into Ghana territory here, I think. It's a hairy mix of memoir, criticism and storytelling that draws on novels from Pride and Prejudice to Price of Salt and Ed Karenina, Conversations with Friends, to illuminate the ways love and novels work and show how some types of love, which don't race to a narrative endpoint, might be the most important of all. Um, and she is currently working on a project, and I think I, I'm right about this, uh, Tina, correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a forthcoming um, monograph on this come here, and this is on reading during lockdown, so lockdown reading, another kind of fantastically interesting topic about that reading. Um, and today, uh, Tina is going to talk to us um, about Helen Garner 
and I think she is posing a fantastic uh, angle and provocation to uh, previous readings of Garner as well. And it's called The First Person at War Work, the fiction of Helen Garner's autobiographical self. Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, in particular, Monique for inviting me and uh, Rosalind and Liz for hosting this. And congratulations on your research centre status at CALP. That's great news. I'm really excited to hear that. Um, and really excited for the sort of potential connections that uh, lie in, in the future. So um, just a, a, a word of context. Um, this is a chapter from a book that I've been working on now for a year or two about uh, first person uh, narrative since the 1970s. Um, and it is a paper that's, that is, um, I think, well, very dear to my heart because I've been a Helen Garner fan since I was very young. Um, but it's uh, the other people in that that constellation. I just I'm just going to say this if it comes up in in later conversation are um, Kutsia, Ishiguru, and Margaret Drabble. So I'm very interested what in what is essentially my you know parents' generation of writers and the way that they uh, think about writing in the context of the 1970s and beyond. Um, in terms of their own uh, their own relationship to writing as something that uh, has a professional uh, status, but is also part of a, a moment of trying to, I think, deprofessionalize things. So that's just the the broad context for the the project, and I think it fits with the idea that. Um, there's some very kind of international conversations in which Australian literature is very important at the moment. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to jump in here. This is going to take, I think about, I haven't read this paper before, I think it's going to take about 35 or 40 minutes, so hopefully we have plenty of time for discussion and that would be great for me just because I'm at such an early stage with this bit of the book. Um, so, uh, there's a scene quite early in uh, Helen Garner's 2009 novel, The Spare Room, where the narrator, Helen, is urged by her friend Nicola to, quote, go home and do some work. Helen had been planning to spend the day at the clinic where Nicola is a cancer patient, but Nicola assures her that she'll be fine getting the treatment alone that day. This is somewhat unconvincing, given that Nicola a temporary guest at Helen's Melbourne house is often prostrate with pain and in need of round the clock nursing. The responsibility for shopping and cooking, changing sheets several times a night, washing the bedding and keeping up communication with the outside world falls entirely to Helen during the three weeks covered by the novel. But in the scene above, Helen takes the train home alone. Here she strips Nicola's bed, hangs up the washing, shops for her grown up but sick daughter and cleans the kitchen. I'm gonna share my screen now, just this is very basic, but I'm just gonna put some, some quotes up there uh, when we get to them. So slideshow. Um, okay, in my kitchen, dishes soon dripped in their wire rack, the countertop shone, Clean linen lay folded in sweet smelling piles. I took a brief nap to prepare myself for another night of disturbance and lamp lit labor. Then I lined up the ingredients for a dainty soup of dashi, tofu and toad noodles. How competent I was. I would get a reputation for competence. This is not of course the kind of work that Nicola had imagined releasing Helen to do. What she was suggesting and what we're invited to imagine is a desk or a text Helen might have sat at, a stream of thought she might have returned to as an alternative to these kinds of chores. Work in this context seems to have as its end point a novel like the one we're reading and to suggest the occupations of Gaga, the author who stands just out of view behind Helen, the narrator of this fiction. A distinction is being drawn and withheld here between the washing, cooking, sweeping, folding, hanging, painting, hauling and wiping that Garner's characters are regularly occupied with 
and the work of making something new in the world. Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition describes this as the difference between labor, that relentlessly repetitive sphere of action, which she keys closely to the biology of existence, the daily fight in which the human body is engaged to keep the world clean and prevent its decay, and work, which she connects with tasks that have an end point, a product in which some trace of our efforts remain. This distinction is often invoked to Arendt's credit. It is not, however, the central point of the human condition, which has a much larger argument to make about the kind of life that such a distinction might serve. Such a life, I'm going to argue today, is also the larger screen for Ghana's concerns. The fact that almost every character Ghana has written about in the last 50 years cares for kids, for meals that need cooking, friends that need nursing, while also journaling, acting, making music or film suggests a late 20th century version of the Viva Activa in which these categories of paid and unpaid, meaningful and boring, intellectual and manual tasks are constantly tested in their relation. But as an inventory of everything we do, her novels are incomplete unless we read them to include the work of her first person narrators about which she's interestingly coy. It's that coyness that I want to consider here, both as a symptom of Ghana's own complex ideological commitments and as an illumination of a larger problematic in which we're all caught up of balancing the categories of labor, work, and a life that might unfold beyond them. Any writer as closely invested in Ghana in showing how real, real people spend their real time is likely to raise the question of where writing itself fits into that daily economy of daily life. This is true of Jane Austen and Charles Dickens, as well as of Ben Lerner and Rachel Cusk. Does writing belong at all to the world being represented? Is it compatible with loafing around, traveling, gossiping, making love, taking drugs with friends? Or is it more like sweeping floors and stripping plaster from the walls of a house? Does writing always require someone who sits apart from the world in a room of her own? Or can a novel ooze from the mind of someone engaged in these relentless forms of activity? Ghana's critics have often seemed to backhandedly suggest that the latter is possible. Monkey Grip, her first novel, was frequently read as a direct artifact fact of the world of share houses she lived in in 1970s Melbourne. Rather than seeing her as an artist reworking her material as fiction, many critics saw her as simply recording its reality, a maker, metaphorically speaking, of lumograms created by placing objects directly onto photographic paper rather than of properly framed photographs. Even when Ghana was praised for capturing the challenges of living as a feminist, her novel writing process was often obfuscated by praise of how truly her writing seemed a diary of the times. The same kind of criticism has been leveled against other women writers throughout the 20th century. I'm thinking here, for example, of the critical dismissal of Mary McCarthy's popular 1963 novel, The Group, which Norman Mailer, vitriolically dismissed as a collective story of a group of women who, quote, whose communal odor is a cross between magriff and contraceptive jelly, unquote, a work that could only squat in its sociological accuracy on the grand avenue of the novel, like a shabby little boutique. Yet Ghana's dismissal as a mere chronicler of life has been complicated by the fact that she's authored so much creative nonfiction and journalism, and by the fact that her best love novels written at either end of her career have unabashedly used the first person perspective of a narrator hard to disentangle from Ghana herself. It's the eye of monkey grip that provoked Ronald Conway, for instance, to suggest in his now classic 1978 quadrant review that Ghana had done less to craft a novel than Colleen McCulloch, an author who wrote much more conventionally, but could at least be credited with putting her stories in the third person. These attacks on Ghana's commitment to the first person have continued across the decades. For CK Stead, writing for the LRB, 
It's a strength as well as a potential weakness that Ghana is always so close to her central character. And Zora Simic, summing things up more recently, claims that Ghana's authorial eye has been the most debated aspect of her career. Now, Ghana herself has done a perfectly good job in interviews and articles of defending herself in these debates, underscoring the creativity it takes to turn a journal into a novel. Meanwhile, the order fictional first person narrator has become a more respectable point of view in 21st century literary circles. It's a formal choice hard to separate now from the celebrated work of authors, including Karl Uwe Knauskor, Maggie Nelson, Tope Falaran, Teju Cole, Rachel Cusk, Ben Lerner, Jenny Offal, Kate Sambrino, Sheila Hetty, and Carmen Machado, all of whom write what has become recognizable as autofiction. This recent body of writing has also made it seem more natural that made narrators expose themselves as professional writers, leading as Ghana's writing does not all the way back to the desk at which the novel we are reading was written. In work by Nelson and Lerner and Knauspor, we learn that even a novel that buzzes intimately in our ear has been crafted in hours rested from childcare and teaching jobs, read by friends and lovers, funded by writing retreats, viewed as an object bought by publishers and represented by agents. These examples make it tempting to propose that what Mark McGill calls the program era of creative writing has promoted the writer as someone who openly works. Perhaps it seems now a progressive move is to it's a progressive move to admit writing to the catalog of activities that show up as necessary when daily life is put on display. Yet yeah, it's to Ghana's first person I, that I want to turn now, not as a sign of her honesty or of her defense of writing as professional work, but as a sign of her investment in keeping up a particular kind of fiction one that imagines in a way that will bring me back to a rent, a better world in which categories of labor and work are held in check by forms of collective life that fiction might support. Now, needless to say, this is a rather ambitious argument um, and I might not convince you of all of its strands today, but hopefully we're going to have some time to talk about this as well. Um, so I'm gonna begin by thinking about the kinds of activity that Ghana's fictions do describe. Conway's blistering quadrant review suggests that the generation of people described in Monkey Grip, people who were born in the forties and are still more or less young in the seventies do next to nothing. In Conway's terms, they blow around like cirrus clouds, self-absorbed clannish characters that seem too busy scrabbling amid sundry sensations with their backsides turned to a larger society. But Conway was a psychologist who spent the years of the Whitlam government publishing books like The Great Australian Stupor. He was unlikely to have looked favorably on the actors, single parents and musicians that Ghana's early writing represents. From another perspective, it might be said that it's this background of the statutory establishment of the Australian Council, the supporting parents and unemployment benefit and a free education and health services that Ghana's 1970s characters uh, that serve as the background for, 90, for Ghana's 1970s characters finding their spheres of action. For instance, in the big brown Fitzroy corner house where the first part of the novel unfolds, and where bacon gets cooked every morning. Nora, a single mother, has time to sweep the matting after breakfast, digging in with the corner of the straw broom and carefully clean the fridge, scrubbing the old yellow enamel with Ajax and polishing it with the warm dishcloth. When the community living in that house is disbanded, Nora and her friend Rita work for many weeks to make a new space livable. We bandaged our heads with scarves and painted and chipped at the old walls and, an absent and, and, and ate absent-mindedly standing in the bare kitchen. 
Once that smaller house is ready, Rita and Nora live there in a way that involves cooking, reading, driving friends to the family planning clinic, doing their washing in an old machine that toils and shrieks, and co-parenting their young daughters with the sense of, quote, beginning each day with the dogged shouldering of a burden too heavy for one person, the responsibility for the life of another human being. There are also in Monkey Grip descriptions of activities that might count more recognizably as creative production. The making of the 1975 cult film, Pure Ship, funded by the Australia Council, occupies many days. And, and Nora attends several performances of music and theater in which her sometimes lover, Javo, a recognized actor with a serious drug habit appears. When Javo accuses Nora of taking no interest in the work he does, she wanders along to Rita's studio an important space whose use is never entirely clear, where she finds him, quote, working neatly and cleverly at a drawing. This seems to feed a dream Nora has soon afterwards of big, airy, open houses, always besides the sea, wind flowing freely through the rooms, people pleasantly disposed or working quietly. But Nora's own work, the work she would do in one of those pleasant rooms with people productively dispersed around her remains hard to pin down. It aligns partly but incompletely with the diary and letter writing important to the plot of the novel. Nora and Javo both keep journals and reading over them as part of the action. Nora and Javo um, Nora also reads fiction at a capacious rate, often consuming two novels a day, including Tolstoy and James, as well as Nina Borden's A Woman of My Age and Lessing's The Golden Notebook. In one key scene, Nora reads and translates a French novel to Javo. And there's mention of The Digger, the feminist socialist magazine, which is linked ever so gently to the wrinkled skin on Nora's writing fingers. But these scenes of reading and writing suggest something more social than the kind of work for which those dream rooms of solitude seem to be reserved. In part, this is typical of the way that Nora, an active character without the serious drug habit of many around her, nevertheless backs away as a matter of principle from work as a category in Monkey Grip. At the end of the novel, her daughter Gracie is becoming more absorbed into a school that seems to inure her tragically to labor. I lay there listening to the quiet falling of warm rain in the alley outside my window. Gracie pushed open my door and came in dripping and smiling with a bag full of work from school and her reader, Rono the Clown. In subsequent interviews about the writing of Monkey Grip, Grana distances herself from the idea that she might have been working in those hours Gracie was at school. In a 1985 conversation, she's explicit about it being supporting parents' benefit that's funded the novel. It was the first time in my life that I had a lot of time each day and a bit of money coming in. Writing over the course of the year, she explains later, didn't seem like work. It seemed like pure pleasure and happiness. Garner's reluctance to talk about monkey grip as work seems to me continuous in some way with her refusal 40 years later in the spare room to have Helen follow up Nicola's suggestion and expose writing as something she works at. But Garner's early reticence to defend monkey grip as the effort of a professional writer can also be situated more easily within that historical moment of the 1970s, where various groups of people push back energetically against traditional ideas of employment in both socialist and feminist frameworks. That decade was one in which progress was made in making work fairer and more accessible to women, but it was also one in which movements across the world saw people resisting work or consciously reclaiming labor from the framework of capitalism. This shows up in The Digger, where articles advise readers on how to grow vegetables, conduct breast exams, make community theater, and support unwaged women workers outside the framework of union activism. It is in this pursuit, the masthead statement of 1975 puts it, of a self-managed society that The Digger 
explores alternative ideas and action which are important to many people but which they can't read about anywhere else. That means we need constant contact <clears throat> and dialogue with people living and organizing in ways that challenge the capitalist, sexist and racist society we live in. The Digger's own editorial team of which Ghana was a key member ran on the same voluntary basis as many of the groups that agitated around the world in this period against the dominance of work in modern life. This included the nine to five movement, the first campaigners for UBI, members of the living labor movement and wages for housework movement. These 1970s discussions as Kathy Weeks has argued more recently, inaugurated what remains our most powerful storehouse of examples of, quote, a critical standpoint from which the alienating and exploitative conditions of modern work can be critically interrogated. One aspect of that 1970s critique of work, one that can be heard in that scene in which Gracie returns from school with her work, is the more gender-specific insight that domestic work should count as much as the jobs for which people are paid. The wages for housework movement, which flourished internationally throughout the first part of the 70s, was a platform for claiming that the work of care, which falls so heavily to women, needs to be made visible as the cornerstone that it inevitably is of any productive society. The demand that domestic work be paid was what made the headlines. But the arguments formulated by Silvia Federici, for instance, and Mary, Maria Rosa Della Costa were in fact less focused on money than on time. It was only by paying for domestic work, they argued, that we would recognize the time it took and could then begin to formulate the kinds of claims for limiting it and sharing it that were possible in the case of paid work. While Ghana didn't align herself specifically with wages for housework, at least as far as I know, um, she did speak, as Bernadette Brennan points out, of the women's movement giving her license to write about what happens in people's houses. Almost all of her writing, Bridget Rooney has argued in a recent piece, can be read as set in one way or another within the framework of the home. We see this in the children's bath, where Athena, mother and homemaker, comes most often into focus. She got up and started her work. She opened every window and every door. She carried newspapers and the pizza boxes down to the bottom of the yard and lit the fire in the incinerator. She turned on the taps of the washing machine and poked the sheets down into the water. She stood, on the rub stood in the rubbish bins, trampled their contents down and lugged them up to the street for tomorrow's collection. She filled a bucket with boiling water and scrubbed the hardened food dribbles off the covered doors. She washed, she washed, she washed. She tended the incinerator and when the fire burned low, she kept it going with hunks of wormy timber that she wrenched off the disused rabbit cage. She did load after load of washing and hung it out to dry. She plunged her hands into the lavatory and carved its stains away. She mopped the kitchen floor and covered it with sheets of newspaper. She got down on her hands and knees and scraped the mold out of the shower and tugged clumps of hair out of the plug hole. She emptied the fridge and set a pan of boiling water inside its ice clogged freezer. The sheets dried so quickly in the sunny backyard that before she finished the cleaning, she was able to remake the beds and tuck them in tightly. The bedroom smelled of cotton. Every kitchen surface was dry and bare. This long passage of attention on, given to Athena's work elevates a traditional sphere of labor, highlighting domestic activities that have gone unrecognized in most literary works. But it is also part of an unsettling of that traditional division of spheres between home and work that the Children's Bach promotes by tuning in so closely to the full and nuanced range of tasks involved in running a house and supporting children and teenagers. We learn in this novel of Athena's soup making of the relentless care for a special needs child. We hear of the buying of school books and uniforms 
the driving to music lessons, the washing and drying and washing and drying of sheets. But we never learn what Dexter, Athena's husband, is paid to do. We're also never led to believe that Athena's homemaking, insufficient as it is to her happiness, might be offset by her having a job outside the home. It's her piano playing for which space must be found, which is celebrated as the counterpart to her labor. The children's Bach avoids the question of how professional writing might appear in this economy by excluding books almost completely from its subject matter. The musical ambitions of the characters might stand figuratively for the literary ones of the writer and reader of fiction, but the narrative's third person delivery makes it possible to imagine a world in which its own production takes up no space. What matters, it seems, is only the squaring of labor with the pleasure of making beautiful things. A third person perspective could also have allowed Garner to leave writing out of the picture in the spare room, that story of one friend so intensively nursing another. Here, once again, the novel attends closely to, women, to a woman's labor. Helen, a person of apparent financial independence, lives next to her grown up daughter and grandchildren. She has a vegetable garden, a range of friends. This might be enough. But the fact that Ghana returns in the spare room to the use of a first person narrator complicates the picture. It is this formal device more than any thematic concern that compels us to ask how writing fits into a life such as Helen's. And that use, that use of I is what makes Helen visible, not as someone more credible, but as someone who has cleared almost improbably the space for Nicola's visit, abandoning the instruments of her trade. We encounter in passing the notebook with a rubber band, the desk covered in documents, the quote, manuscript of a Vietnamese woman I was supposed to have read last week. In, and she's abandoned these things in order to become a full-time nurse. It is this first person that suggests the labor of care is not just arduous in its own terms, but because of the other ways of time, of spending time that such labor crowds out. In other ways, the spare room is as hostile as the children's bath to the pleasures and accomplishments of earning a living. We never learn what Nicola has done before her illness, although it seems to have something to do with playwriting or what Helen's daughter, mother to the children next door, works at when not carrying a sick toddler in her arms. While we meet the staff involved in treating Nicola, many of them are discredited as charlatans. A visitor from next door turns out to be a salesperson, hawker of dubious magnetic devices. Helen's friend, a professional psychologist who advises her in his off-duty moments, becomes a opaque as soon as Helen tries to imagine him working. Rather than describing his office, her thoughts turn to the dog who's excluded from it. Where did he keep the dog while he worked? Did it have a beanbag in the kitchen to sleep on, a bone to gnaw, a flat bowl of fresh water? All of this suggests that Ghana's focus thematically is still on the relentless rhythms of washing and cleaning and cooking in which Helen often takes pride. Three times that night I tackled the bed, stripped and changed, stripped and changed. This was the part I liked. Straightforward tasks of love and order I could perform with ease. But if this is really the case, why does Ghana introduce through the first person narrator the figure of the writer who works. Why make the relation between work and labor? I'm using this distinction for now as a kind of shorthand without wanting to instantiate it. A side of tension when it doesn't have to be. And why write a novel addressing this relation at all if the point is simply to make labor in general visible? In what way does the novel's own writing complicate and extend what it has to say about the different components of the active life. So I want to go back now to Arendt for a moment as a writer who unpacks this question politically. Despite um, the work's prominence, 
um, as an account in Arendt's own terms of what it is we do, the human condition is in some ways a strange text to turn to in relation to Ghana. It was critiqued by 1970s feminists for its failures of attention to gender, and it remains in many ways at odds with those claiming solidarity in Marxist terms with workers or with the ideas of state organized work. Yet as an argument against our lives having become so organized around the idea of work, the human condition remains one of the 20th century's more prescient indictments of modern life. The long perspective Arendt takes here goes back to a classical society where both labor, the daily routines of feeding and caring, and work of making, writing, welding, building, etc., happen behind the closed doors of the household. This classical organization of work and labor was obviously problematic in the limited roles it assigned women and its reliance on enslaved people, as well in Arendt's view by a dramatic underestimation of how important labor might be to the good life. But what it enabled, at least in the form of the parabolic example that Arendt takes it to be, was participation in a public sphere where action and speech were disentangled from the forms of work and labor that people did in the privacy of their own households. In this light, Arendt argues, classical society may have devalued labor but the much graver mistake modern society has made is to overvalue it. Despite our apparent wish to release ourselves from labor, modernity has had the opposite effect of glorifying all of its qualities and then redefining work to fill its place. In our world, the seeming elimination of labor as the painful effort to which all human life is bound had first of all the consequence that work is now performed in the mode of laboring and that the product of work, objects for use, are consumed as though they were consumer goods. Our jobs, in other words, have taken on this, the original character of labor. They've become activity that feels necessary, that binds us, but that leaves no mark of lasting ethical consequence. Moreover, the human condition argues, where citizens of an ancient world entered public space, space on the condition that their labor and work were done, the distinctive feature of modern life is that work has become the primary grounds on which we meet outside the home. This is a rent. The most private of all human activities, laboring has become public and been permitted to establish its own common realm. The irony of this is acute in Arendt's terms, for as long as we only appeal to each other as workers, there can, quote, be no true public realm, but only private activities displayed in the open. In my extended version of this paper, I'd want to spend a bit longer here, suggesting the line of agreement that can be drawn between Arendt and the position of feminists like Federici and Della Costa he saw in the 1970s that while labor might be recognized in its own right as being indispensable to society, um, that work might also be resisted as the only category that would rescue us from this labor or draw us into public life. But here, because my job is to get back to Ghana, I'm just going to ask that you trust me when I say that in Arendt's emphasis on labor, as something that has its rightful place in the good life. She's also anticipating those arguments and settings of the 1970s that connect the need to make the domestic more visible with that other objective of limiting the dominance of work as the only space we can imagine for public life. But what those calling for wages for housework in the 1970s have in common with Arendt, and this is my main point here in turning to her as a more abstract way of thinking about the issues in Ghana, is that they do so in the name of a much larger cause, which is the defense of a life in which domestic necessity, work and action might be restored to a distinct and proper relation. The balance, as Arendt in particular imagines it, is between one, the tasks which are non-negotiable to human existence, 
but also leavening in their effect. I, we must all, must all labor, feed our kids, wash our clothes, et cetera, et cetera, to work, which for a rent happens individually and with discrete outcomes. And three, action, which would arise from our equal but different roles within a political community. As people seated once work and labor were done around what Arendt describes metaphorically as a common table that would both join and separate us. That balance between these categories of action is only possible in Arendt's account if these, if they, if, if these categories are distinguishable from each other. This means that work must be different from labor and that action must be different from work. But let me bring this back now to Ghana's The Spare Room. For the example that Arendt unfolds most fully in the human condition is that of writing, which she teases out from labor and from action. On the first count, writing, she argues, should not be conflated with thinking, which occupies the same level as labor in being endless and necessary and leaving no trace. Writing differs from thinking on these grounds because it's a form of activity um, a and has to do with material forms. Whenever the intellectual worker wishes to manifest his thoughts, he must use his hands and acquire manual skills just like any other worker. In other words, thinking and working are two different activities which never coincide. The thinker who wants the world to know the content of his thoughts must first stop thinking and remember his thoughts. In according writing this status as work, Arendt might seem to be bending towards what I've already mentioned in the context of autofiction as the tendency to give it a kind of recognition as professional occupation to suggest along with Nelson or Lerner or Knausgård that it takes time away from the home and from the child and from the washing to write a book, but that it's honorable and necessary because of this. But Arendt's point in these passages where she describes writing is less to celebrate it in these kind of Protestant terms than to use it as an example to redefine what we mean by work or fabrication as something that is distinct from labor. The category of work as she wants to use it is fundamentally not necessary to existence. It's not labor and it does leave a mark. In a world where all activities of value have become attached to making a living, doing a job, it is art, she argues, that gives us a glimmer of what all work should be and might once have been, which is the kind of making we can do once our basic needs are met. This places on writing a very different value to the one that's been afforded it in an era of creative writing degrees <coughs> and auto fictional accounts of the time it takes to become a writer. We've become used to thinking of even first person writing as something that might be worked at as, Mag as Maggie Nelson suggests, while hooked up to a high grade breast milk pump or sold speculatively as Ben Lerner reveals at the beginning of 1004 for a high price before it's even, even done. In these scenarios, it seems worth setting aside other duties of care to write as Canal Squad professes to doing while for other forms of relation suffer and dissolve. Writing begins to seem in these terms like another kind of highly respectable labor, something ceaseless and necessary to existence in the ways that duties of care and sustenance can also seem. We're all laborers now, Arendt claims, all bound by that modern logic by which, by which only that which is seen as work seems legitimate as an activity um, and in which anything in that category seems necessary in this very basic sense to survival. So this has taken me a long way from Ghana, but I hope you can see that there's a bit of an argument becoming visible here for the possibility that while Ghana is also invested in work, at least the work of writing as something that her first person narrators conspicuously do, it is never in her terms confused with the realm of labor that she's committed to representing. 
When it comes to Ghana, the evidence that she's interested in this relation between work and labor rests not on what she says. In fact, the point I've been making, or one of them, is that she says very little about the work of writing. But on her persistent use of the first person subject position as one that intercepts the life world of which she writes. In this account, the work appears formally rather than thematic, work appears formally rather than thematically in Ghana's fiction, not because she disregards it but because it remains ideally of a different representational order from cooking and childcare, nursing and washing, a realm that is more private and individual than those elements of common life into which both labor and politics bind us, but no less necessary for all this to her ideal of an active life. Should all this seem a bit far-fetched, and I can well imagine it might in the sort of kaleidoscopic form I'm giving it to you today, I want to return to one concrete example from the spare room, which is the one carefully plotted scene where Ghana exposes Helen at work. Helen's task is to write a review of a magic show being performed at the small Melbourne theatre, the Butterfly Club. It's the one writing job she's been commissioned to do during the time of Nicola's stay. We know this because her plans to write it in the public library, away from the washing and the interruptions of Bessie, are thwarted by Nicola needing a lift to the station. But we hear of the show in the framework of the novel, which captivates, um, where it captivates both Helen and Nicola, uniting them for the night they go to see it in wonder at its simple and luminous improbability. The magician's art, as Helen describes it, is to make everyday items, balls, ropes, um, a tomatoes, vanish, shape shift and reappear. But his real magic seems to lie in the effortlessness of his delivery, cued up by his opening lines, delivered in a conversational tone. The most beautiful things happen secretly and privately. These lines obviously resonate with Ghana, for they also appear in her actual review, which was published in the monthly in 2005 under the title, The Man with the Pearl White Cord. Here, Ghana reveals a much longer research phase underpinning her publication. She's taken her sister and seen the show three times, as well as interviewing the magician in order to write it. But Garner strikes the same chord as Helen in emphasizing the show's effortlessness. Some people who are illusionists, said Haza when I visited him one afternoon in his crumbling first floor St Kilda flat, like to do the big things, putting someone in a box, cutting them in half, making an elephant disappear. But that's not enough for me. I like working with my hands, using the whole person as the act. I want people to give all their attention to what I'm doing so we can be surprised together. I don't want them to think. I want people to be wrapped. Ghana's affinity with, ha with Haza's position as a performer opposed to showmanship is borne out in comparison of her two renderings of his show. In rewriting her review for Helen's account of it in the spare room, Ghana condenses and simplifies its details. Her work, which includes both the work of writing the review in the first place and the work of writing the fictional scene in which the review features, becomes a magic as ideally invisible to her audience as the magician's is to his. While the labors of her characters, Nora, Athena, Helen, all get dilated in her novels. Here, it's the invisibility of Helen's work that qualifies it for the best, for the highest form of recognition. That emphasis on the most beautiful things being private, repeated across Garner's review and in the spare room, also resonates in this context with Arendt's insistence that work should be something private not because it doesn't matter, but because the sphere of public discourse can only be properly experienced if it's not dominated by work. For a rent, that public sphere of activity, that realm in which we act once our work is done, matters more than either work or labor. But it's only accessible in her terms because those other forms of necessary and private activity 
can be completed. Action is also the category hardest to write about. It's impossible alone, relational, but it's also constitutionally unforeseeable, visible only in stories, nascent in its accommodation of the ever new next generation. It is the place where thinking happens, but only through discourse and relation, the very kinds of relation that are possible because of the sameness in which we're united as laborers and the differences that we unfold in our work. The extreme optimism of the human condition lies here in this sense of what an active life might be, not because we've arrived at a universally post-work society, but because we've arrived at one where labor is re recognized as a common necessity, where laborers also have time and space to work and where the activity of public life opens out in front of us as the real sphere of change making. This is not an argument that Ghana gives us in any equivalently direct form. I do think in the end, she is as interested in some form of common and public life in which literature might participate as, as a rent is. And if I were to extend this reading here, I would begin with those scenes at the end of Monkey Grip where novels and the appreciation of novels circulates at the public pool, suggesting a way in which the generous form of common life that happens there is in fact, the one into which the writer's work ultimately gets released. But this is long enough for now, I think. And Ghana is, after all, in a very different business from a rent. I don't want to collapse their positions or suggest that they share a single ethical horizon. Now, one takeaway from my argument that I do want to insist on is that the representation of labor that characterizes so much of Ghana's writing is not an endorsement of it, a stuckness within it, but a keenness on her part to move beyond it to a sphere of work that might signify very differently if it was seen as one small part and part one private aspect of what we do. Her use of the first person, I've argued, is not a sign of how close she is to her material or how immediate her writing is to the action it reports on, but of the distance she wants to open up between work and labor as things that get shown differently. The privacy of her first person as a writer signifies in this sense, um, both as a recognition of work and as a commitment to the worlds of labor and action that it cannot replace. And that's the end. So I will stop sharing. Thank you for such a fantastic paper. <laughs> I didn't want you to stop. I wanted you to do to keep going. Um, and um, but I'm, and I'm sure people will have loads of questions. I know certain people will uh, um, I can imagine what they're going to be asking. If you would like to ask a question directly, you know, uh, raise your hand or whatever, and or you can also put something in the chat. Or if I overlooked you, signal in the chat that you want to speak. Can you? Um, so is everyone got the chat there open? Yeah, okay, great. And Ros, if you could have a look at the chat too to make sure that I'm not missing something, okay. Um, I think if I can just start, um, I knew Joseph, Joseph is already talking, I knew Joseph was going to leap in. Um, uh, Joseph has, um, is working on, on um, Helen Garner. So we might go to Joseph first and then I'll come back. That would be great. He writes, thanks so much for the marvellous paper, exciting stuff. I was wondering how you might situate Ghana's published diaries, I was going on to that too, most recently, How to End a Story, within your argument. Surely the diary entry is the form that most clearly posits writing as something like a pleasurable chore or daily work. Um, <clears throat> yeah, good question. I mean, I think, um, well, I should say that I actually haven't read. Um, I've I've read um, some. I've read some reviews of the diaries. I haven't read those diaries, and I sort of deliberately haven't read them yet. I will read them before I before I finish the chapter, but I sort of deliberately didn't read them because I really wanted to focus on the work at hand here as the work of writing narrative 
Um, and to try and think about that as a sort of particular form of making. Um, so I do think that there, I do think that diary, I do think that diary writing um, is sort of compatible with action in a way that fiction making might not be in the sense that it's possible to do all kinds of writing, note taking, diary writing, um, emailing, <laughs> letter writing uh, as part of a sort of daily round of activities, which Joseph, I think is, is what you're suggesting. Um, and I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think Ghana herself in the, the interviews and, and, and um, pieces that I've read where she talks about her own diary writing also seems to feel that it's like that, that for her that belongs to this other sort of daily world that she's so invested in rather than to the sort of work of writing. So I, it might be that that's where the line of distinction false that this is you know that that what I'm focusing on when I'm saying that there are two very different different things is that the the work for which you need the quiet airy room is not the work of diary writing but the work of in her case I guess diary editing I mean it's that work that she's been doing in the last years with those diaries as I understand it um, and that something else you know, something, there's something else other than the writing of diaries that um, the quiet, solitary room suggests. And I mean, I think also Nora's dream of the room um, suggests that. I think, you know, because we know a lot about diary writing, but she doesn't need a quiet, solitary room in which to work on her diary, at least not in her 30s. That's not the, that's not the point. But she does dream of the quiet, solitary room in which she's going to work. It is there in her sort of um, imagination as part of an ideal world. Um, so I, I think we, I think, I think we, I think I would situate it. I mean, to answer your question directly, I think I would situate it pretty much where you do on the side of the pleasurable chore or daily work. I mean, I think that might be where it falls. It falls out. Um, the diaries are amazing. I think you're really wise yeah. not to, um, to to look at them as you're doing the narrative work, um, but they are so surprising. <laughs> yeah, and, no, and, I, I, oh I, I really, oh yeah. you know, yeah. and because you know how her writing is so uh, animated, so animate, you know, and anyway, and then in these diaries, it's just like every single one is exquisite, you know, like kind of thing yeah. has a charge of a day or a charge of a moment in it. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to ask you on a similar line, but perhaps it's getting a bit, we're going on the same ground, is that when she when she talks about, um, and she's famous for carrying a diary around and writing, writing things down mm. and terrifying people that they're going to appear in, as they do in the spare room, as they do yeah. In, yeah. in various things. Um, and so it is very much a public activity um, and uh, for her that she's writing in public on the bus in, mm -hmm. when she's having dinner with friends. Or the, mm. the collective is... Really? When she, is that part of the... <laughs> sure, she's having dinner. Yes. And okay. she said that people have said to her, please, you know, can we have one of those occasions where you don't? But, but it is... Um, and she, you know, talks about that really, really well too mm -hmm. as you can imagine um but there mm -hmm. is a kind of um public space issue where she goes to the public library when she's writing monkey grip um mm -hmm. and she's happy there and she writes in public um and but mm -hmm. then insists mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that they are in the incredible labor of i don't know if i'm using labor in your terms here but the labor of that crafting Mm. they are you know kinds of texts. Yeah. yeah yeah I mean I you know I mean it, it doesn't surprise me at all um to hear you talk about the diaries like that I mean I imagine that they are wonderful in all the ways that that you're suggesting and you know I mean I 
I guess, and the older I get, the more I enjoy actually, you know, turning to the letters. I've really, in the last few years, spent lots of time reading sort of novelists that I love in letter form, I think, for some of those reasons. Um, so I think it is, but I think I really am invested in the distinction between that kind of writing that you can do in those spaces and the possibility of writing as standing here in my argument, the writing of narrative as standing for another kind of work that's, that's more like, you know, making a beautiful wrought iron gate or something that it really requires it requires tools, it requires, and the, you know, the, the tools of its trade in some sense are, are solitude and stepping back from the action. So I, I'm not at all dismissing the idea that you can write while in action. I mean, you know, every teenager seems very proficient at this these days. And I suspect that in the future, there may be fewer and fewer scenes of writing that involve actually needing to be you know in some metaphorical way offline or um you know I think the writing to the moment it is the moment of writing to the moment yeah, true. um yeah. but I do think I do think for the purposes of this this project I am quite interested in the idea that there's another kind of writing and that you know Ghana is a very interesting writer for me precisely because she she does these two things and seems so conscious of the fact that there might be these two things and that everybody also everybody might need the their own equivalent of these two things you know you might need if you're you know if, if cooking is your work you might need to be able to also make scrambled eggs at a you know the drop of a hat and also make very beautiful elaborate meals like there might be these two aspects to everybody's life um so yeah, i'm invested lovely. in that distinct lovely yeah analysis. beautiful um has anybody else got questions that rose i don't know if you can see anybody i have a question if we're waiting, but I mean, I don't want to leap in if um, if other people have uh, questions. Oh, can you see anything in the chat? I'm, I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading um, Monique's work. Oh, Monique is there, fabulous. Where's Monique? I've got the, okay. Um, uh, oh, there you are, Monique, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I mean, so Monique's um, asking about that question where Javo is drawing and the focus on his hands. Um, and yeah, is he a figure for the writer, not just Nora? And I wondered, you know, what's happening there with that gendered uh, inversion? Yeah, I mean, I'm just agreeing with this. Like, I also, in this rereading of, that my latest reading of Monkey Grove, I was also really fascinated with that, like the, the fact that Javo becomes someone who can draw. I mean, who knew, like this guy seems to be able to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it seems a little, I, I mean, it seems a little implausible that he can, he's also a beautiful artist. So it, in that sense, it, it does seem to, it does seem to be deliberate in a way that is not just documentary, I think it's, um, and the focus on the hands, I also noticed that. I mean, I don't, I mean, I mean, I don't think we necessarily need to think that, um, yeah, and he writes poetry, yeah, he's, he's amazing, obviously. Um, we need, the world needs more Javos. Um, but the, the, I mean, I don't think we need to focus on it. On, I don't think all these forms of work need to be figures for writing. I mean, that in a way is, it, I mean, that's uh, that's a kind of reading that I'm always tempted to uh, to do myself. But I think um, in being interested in work as a category that regardless of its, its kind of, um, its particular output has status in a potentially sort of better world, then the point would not be so much that, that, that you know, writing was 
uh, a kind of master trope for that work, but that thinking about the, the making of narrative is one way that we have left to us for thinking about what the making of everything should yeah. be for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that obviously not everybody should be a writer and not everybody in, in I mean, you know, I don't think Javo is drawing, I mean, maybe, maybe Javo should be an artist, maybe, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that different people might be and they might not all be creative in the ways that we associate with writing a narrative, but they would all somehow occupy Yes, that private space in which the hands are in focus somehow as a, a and where there is attention and privacy and uh, self-fulfillment of a very particular kind that is justifiable, not because it not because it feeds into ideals of productivity, but precisely because in a collective life, it is a space where it justifies kind of retreat to the individual. Um, I mean, yeah. I think uh, uh, Bridget Vincent has a question. Bridget, are you there? Hi, yes, thanks. Um, that was a fascinating paper, thank you. Um, I was wondering, I'm very curious about what you make of her earlier courtroom writings in this context, in that um, they, when you're talking mm. about, uh, you know, professions, um, you know, there are scenes in which sometimes Ghana sets herself up as a sort of counterpoint to, to the professions in that, you know, mm. here, are the, here are these lawyers um, yeah. and her authorial voice is one that sometimes I, I would say self-consciously constructs itself as a kind of scrappy, unlicensed outsider who is able to see things mm. that, that these professional um, lawyers uh, you know, might not mm. see. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I think what's so fascinating about that as well is that in, you know, in the courtroom writings, these are scenes of labour, which not only involve professions with a capital P, mm -hmm. but professions that involve some of the same processes and tensions that you're talking about in that they are people who also work with words uh, and and this is a space that sort of fuses the private and the public in really interesting ways as well in that it's you know it's the mm -hmm. ultimate public sphere but a lot of these crimes under investigation are you know domestic um, mm -hmm. so yeah I'm yeah. wondering how how these writings yeah. might play into what you're what you're thinking about thanks yeah, no, that's that's really really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, I don't I don't have an I don't have an answer. Um, I I have read I have read I think that you know the writings that we're thinking about here, mm, and I I think it's I think I think I I think I you know my mind travels in similar directions from the ones that you've just mapped out basically I mean the relation between public and private I think is something that um what could I could think about more in those in those texts as sort of defense or or sort of illustration of just how conscious Ghana herself is of these different spheres and the ways in which sort of life consists not of one or the other, but of the junctures where they meet. Um, and of those, you know, that in some sense happiness or the success of a life, I think, lies with the those meeting places, right? Like, you know, those meeting places being productive and the balance between those spheres being you know, product being operative in a sort of healthy way rather than in any single sphere. So I think, I think what you've given me is a is a really good idea for how to sort of defend my sense that she's that she's much more interested in that relational quality of the good life than in any one sphere in it in it in itself. Um, I think turning to those writings in that context could be could be really a good idea. I think that's great. So thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, Joseph, whether you wanted to ask about the, the creative writing 
aspect, the writing life. I was thinking of you when Tina was talking about this. Did you want to ask about that? The program, you know, the era of writing and the era of creative writing. Did you have anything you wanted to ask? Aha, of course I do, he says. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, so can and you mind if I come back then to Daniel um, in a second if um, if because I've, I've just asked that question rather than being confusing. Joseph, what did you want to ask? Liz, does Joseph need to be unmuted or given? Oh, I think he might have to be. Yeah. I can't do that. that. Can you do I that, Ros? Find him. Yep. You can see Ros has got it under control. I'll allow him to talk. <laughs> can you hear, can you talk now, Joseph? I think I think that does it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, great. Thanks so much. I mean, you know, yes, I, I was immediately, immediately sort of my, my ears uh, pricked up when I heard mention of Mark McGill's work, which I'm really, really interested in. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I have a kind of direct question on that front, um, so much as some of my own kind of curiosities about thinking about. Ghana as a kind of program era writer and some of the complexity of, of doing so, which is, you know, essentially that in one sense, she is very much a figure of that period in that she's involved in a series of writer and residencies um, and, you know, these kind of sessional teaching gigs at an assortment of different universities. Um, but then there's an interesting sense in which she's also closely tied to what the girl thinks of as being the kind of major supplementary institution to writing prior to the rise of the university, uh, which is for him mm. uh, essentially journalism. Um, and mm. I just wondered whether you'd sort of sort of sort of thought about her as a kind of in-between figure on that front as well. Um, she's mm. very, very much part of that moment um, mm. and also a kind of you know delightful relic of the previous moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. I mean, I also, I also like that. I also like Miguel's work. Um, um, I, I think the people, I think the particular gener, the, the generation I'm interested in, I think is interesting to me partly because they do that work of spanning these moments as you're talking about, like, I mean, I think one way of thinking about these different sort of moments for the um, recognition of writing as part of the sort of world we want to live in is to think about people who are sort of not, not kind of born native into any of them, but themselves travel between them. So I think in a way, I'm, I mean, I certainly find that you know, the Ghana, uh, Kutsia, Drabble generation more interesting uh, to think with in these terms than this kind of, this, this, this generation, new generation of, of sort of auto-fictional writers, genera you know, educated within that program era. And I think, you know, there are some of the reasons for that you've just, you've just kind of flagged for me. Um, so again, Good, good, good stuff to think about. I don't have more, I think, to say than that. Yeah, yeah, I think, sure. it, I think it's really interesting. And I think, I mean, I think there are other, many other people of her generation who, who about whom we could say the same, that, you know, it's one of the, it, it complicates Miguel's work in a good way to think about these longer careers, I think, who, that have moved yes. in and out. Of, yeah, so I think yeah. I, I think you're, you're you're totally spot on about that. Um, and if I could ask just a teensy little bit of a follow up question, I mean, mm. I, I did sort of jot down the other figures that that you're thinking through, um, and it does mm. strike me. I, I, I'm afraid I don't know very much about about Drabble, but it, it does strike me that you know Kutzea is involved in setting up the creative writing program at the University of Cape Town, of course, teaches literature mm. for a long time, both in the US mm -hmm. and in South Africa, um, and mm. then. If I recall correctly, I'm pretty sure that Ishiguro is um, one of the kind of early uh, MA students at Anglia yeah, Ruskin. Yeah, he, yeah, he is. He's, he's, he is along with Ian McEwen. And he's also 15 years younger than the other ones. So for me, he's kind of a transitional figure into thinking about 
some of these uh, recent people that Daniel's talking about. So yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Can we lead into Daniel then, please? Daniel, sure. are you there? You've, you've, you've got your, we've got the question or your comment in, in the chat, but is, uh, is Daniel trying to speak and we are muting him in any way, Ross? Is that, is that... I've allowed him to speak, so if he's there, he can... You're trying not to speak. I'm not trying oh, to speak. Okay. You don't want, you just want to go with the, with the question. Okay. So okay. Daniel, yeah, can you yeah. read that um, clearly, uh, Tina? Okay. So uh, Daniel's talking about, um, so uh, Niles Dolan recently talked about how often contemporary writers are pushed into auto fiction realms by critics, publics, uh, examples being Ferrante and Sally Rooney. Um, how does this gender dimension fit into Arendt's ideas of public private labor work? Um, well, <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think it, it does. I mean, I don't think Arendt helps us at all with the gender dimension really of the, this argument. Um, and I don't know, I mean, that's not, I, I mean, I don't want to, try and make a rent do that work particularly I think there are a lot of other people who are better at thinking about the gender dimension of how writers are made to sort of represent the private but I guess here you're not thinking so much about just write these writers as people who, who expose the private you're also thinking about these as writers who are sort of accused in that that sort of um uh, critical way of of exposing themselves as well so it's not just about the fact that they they talk about what happens um, in bedrooms and kitchens but that they talk about they talk directly from their own life is that correct Daniel or are you more interested in I mean you're interested in the accurate when you say auto fiction realms by critics um uh, because I, you know, I, I, I yeah, um, <laughs> I, because I mean, I guess I'm, I feel that in some ways the auto fictional stuff, at least from a sort of North American perspective these days is, is not so gendered. Um, it's become in a, a bit more of a level playing field, I, I would say. I mean, you know, with Lerna and um, I think uh, Canal Score is, you know, so important for people who are really into auto fiction. I was recently at a, a, a seminar at, at Duke on, on the sort of auto fictional turn and Canal Score was definitely the the touchstone for everybody, the go-to figure of the, the sort of auto-fictional writer. So I guess that makes me think that what's going on there with auto-fiction uh, isn't, isn't as gendered as one might fear in relation, say, to Ferrante and, and Rooney. Um, but obviously I'm, obviously I'm, I'm, you know, I feel heavily that we should push back against the idea that women are more inclined to write about their own lives. I mean, than men, I think that's a, a, a terrible, terrible tendency to, to work with. And, you know, this work I've been doing, thinking about Garner and, and Drabble in these ways is for me important, partly as, as, you know, my own small contribution to that pushback, I would say. So, yeah, I think that's, it's, such valuable work I think the, the the fidelity that people expect between the life and the work too the expectation of women to somehow be faithful or there to be a, an alignment between that is is mm. happily complicated by Garner I think um yeah. Joseph's got another question can I just I mean you're not hogging so much I'm very conscious that Tina's been working very hard um but I I um I don't know if this is a question or not, Tina, but it's about uh, Wolf's room of, one, room of One's Own mm -hmm. and um, the, as being a kind of figure for generations of women writers, um, that what you needed was a room of your own and that the room itself, that private room, mm. would be the facilitating 
mm. mechanism mm. for writing. And obviously there are yes, class yes. issues, major class issues and all of this. But the the question of that, is that labor or is that work or well, I mean, yeah, it's I mean I've been thinking a lot about that, Liz. So I mean I guess I I mean I guess my tendency 10 years ago would have been to think of myself as kind of advancing these arguments for women needing, you know, privacy <laughs> or, or some, you know, room of one's own kind of argument. And I think where I've landed up now in my 50s is with this sense that actually the privacy stuff isn't so much, I think, I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which our own privacy is under, under threat, but as a sort of metaphorical space for thinking about the production of writing, I don't think it's any more, it doesn't seem to me that that's where the jeopardy really is now. I'm much more worried about the public, much more worried about the public. And so working, I mean, the, my personal investment in this would be, you know, ways to work out where, where we as, as, as human beings and as a society need to have those private spaces in some kind of productive relationship to a public sphere that for humanists these days, I think is, 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 is much more rapidly um, being lost yeah. than our private spaces. Um, you know, partly thanks to the pandemic, this has just become, seems so urgent to me right now. But I don't think the problem is that we don't have enough uh, rooms in which to sit and write. I am a bit more worried these days about the fact that all we have is rooms in which we sit and write. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I know. Can I ask a, a follow up question? Yeah. But, I was kind of, I was sort of I'm very intrigued by this this idea of you know connecting Ghana to this public sphere and public dimension. I thought your your argument was really really interesting and really well made. But um, I just want to go back to this idea that she had an investment in a type of that's so your starting premise that she had an investment in a type of fiction where a better collectivized world is supported by fiction. And I was thinking, oh, that's kind of a utopian structure. But then I started mm. thinking, well, or is it a kind of a, a heterotopia that you're mm. saying that Ghana is doing, where there are sort of embedded sites that both mirror and distort? And then, and then I suppose for me there's a sort of a utopia, sort of like a public direct statement, whereas a heterotopia is kind of an oblique way of coming at that better world. Um, and then I started thinking about that in relation to the domestic labour movement and rent and those kinds of arguments. Um, and my question, I suppose, is why, what do you think Ghana's doing in that she's not more direct about this? If there is this agenda at work in these texts that mm. you're kind of speaking about and complicating, why is she not more direct? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that partly that sort of utopian commitment to a, a world in which there was, a, you know, a world in which the public sphere was really activated and able to do its work would require us kind of stepping back from our own work as individuals. And I mean, many people have formulated this idea that you sort of drop a novel, you, you drop your work into the public and the public does what it will with it. You're not, you're not, you know, you're not in charge of what happens to a work once it becomes the property of a public sphere. Um, and that's as it should be. Like there is something about, there is something about, um, um that that idea that's useful here I think for you know you don't try and foreclose what happens in the public sphere by anticipating it as a private individual you do your work as a private individual and then you join the public sphere as someone who is open to all of the contingencies of public life mm -hmm. um and that is its you know that is its its, its beauty um but you know, I mean, I think in terms of Ghana's commitment to uh, public life, I mean, a lot of that, I mean, it is utopian, but it is also about, I mean, she's she's very, she's been very conscious, I think, to mark what she owes to the, to the sort of era of institution building and public life in the 70s in Australia. And 
I mean, I think, you know, she, she, she I mean, when I, when I've read uh, interviews and essays of hers, I'm, I'm just, you know, struck by how as a sort of intellectual, she is just very insistent really that, that, you know, those structures of government funding for something like public life around literary production have been absolutely central to her work, but so has, you know, the institutions of the, you know, the welfare state, the, the, the spaces that she marks, like that library scene that I think, you know, it, it has come up. I mean, this isn't just about saying, hey, I like to work in the library, it's my personal preference. I mean, marking the fact that the public library is what makes her work as a private writer possible is a very explicit statement, actually, I think. Um, and Monk, yeah. Labour as change making in public life is not offered in a direct form, though. That's my question. No, it's no. I mean, I don't think, but I don't think there is. I mean, you know, Arendt's a philosopher who makes that argument in a direct form, but she also, she also makes many, many statements about how it is not up to her. She cannot say what the public change making is going to look like. She's committed to the idea that we have to, we have to have a public that is open to strangers, open to our children, open to a next generation, and that it's the making space for others in that public life that is our responsibility, not the dictating of agendas for the future. Um, that's her position. And I think there's something, you know, I, I think this is, that's as explicit as you can get if you want to, to sort of recreate her version of what a public sphere is. It's a space that we hold as custodians open for the dialogues that are only possible if we keep talking to each other and different people in that public way. And, you know, I, I, you just can't say what that conversation is going to be. So there's a limit to how explicit you can be. You have to defend its structures, not its content, I think. Um, um, sorry, that's a bit of an evasive answer, but. Um, oh, no, no, that's really interesting. Yeah, fantastically yeah. interesting. Um, I am conscious that we have come to the end of our time. Um, it has rushed past, flown by, um, Tina. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I am an Australianist. That's my kind of gig. And I can't tell you how fabulous it is to have someone come in and open, open it up like the way that you have and to read Ghana's work in this way. Yeah. Um, and I think you've really, when I was reading your abstract, it just felt so right about her. <laughs> It just, the, the, I mean, the thought of it and the feeling of it just felt so right about it and just such a great way to read her work at this point in time. So thank you. Great. We look forward to everything that you write about it. Um, and thank you for such yeah. a wonderful paper today. Yeah, it's been great to talk to you all. Thanks for such great questions and comments. It's really, really helped me to be excited about this. So I hope to see you all in, in some other form one day in the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Mom. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks very much. Liz. Bye. <laughs>